Bibles to John chapter 3. Please, good to see all of you this morning as we continue our series verse by verse in the Gospel of John. Chapter 3, we come to the next text in John 3. Last time we looked at verses 22 through 27. Today we will look at verses 28 through 30. Follow along as I read John 3, 28 through 30. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let us pray. Our Father, as we approach this very important text in your word, we pray that you would help us to expound on it correctly, accurately, and apply it in the same way. We pray, O oh God, that you would glorify your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the ministry of your word today in such a way that we would all lay our lives down at your feet afresh in dedication, surrender, and trusting in you to give us grace to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The title is, He Must Increase, But I Must Decrease, A Call for a Christ-Centered Ministry. There are many ministries in the world, but are they all Christ-centered in terms of the churches that are scattered throughout the entire earth? And the answer is no. Surprisingly, those churches, many of them that profess to be Christian churches, are not Christ-focused and centered. As we direct our attention to the text, let me just summarize the larger context, which is verses 22 through 30, which describe a heated discussion, you'll remember, from our last couple of messages between the followers of John the Baptist, his disciples, with the Jewish religious leaders, one leader in particular who is not mentioned in the text. And the topic of discussion and controversy was called purification, or in other words, baptism. The crowds that were following John the Baptist are beginning to dwindle, while Jesus is attracting greater masses of people. But John the Baptist isn't disappointed about this, because after all, he makes it clear that Christ's glory, not his own, was his mission. And seeing Christ's glory increasing and the attention that Christ is getting compared to his diminishing attention is actually making John the Baptist happy. It's not discouraging him. Normally, when other people get the attention and the spotlight, human nature would respond with what? Jealousy and envy, even resulting in anger and in murder, like in the case of Cain and Abel. So it's natural for human beings to think of our world revolving around ourselves rather than around Christ and other people. And it's unnatural for human nature to be humble and to gladly accept the spotlight to be on other people and content for others to get the attention rather than ourselves. Sinful human nature craves attention, craves for people to focus on us rather than others. But <clears throat> selfishness and pride and egotism and arrogance and narcissism are incompatible with Christianity. We have to be self-effacing if we're to draw attention to Christ, if we're to proclaim Christ, if we're to lead others to Christ. We're to direct people to Christ. And so narcissism 
has no place, egotism has no place in the Christian faith, let alone should it dominate one's motives and thoughts as Christian leaders. And we have too many egotists, too many egotists occupying the pulpits and the leadership of many Christian churches today. May God have mercy and purge our churches from egotism. The Bible teaches that rather than seeking the spotlight for ourselves and our own applause, we should be happy when our efforts cause other people to praise God and to glorify Christ. Most people don't like selfishness and self-centeredness. Ever notice the self-centered, selfish person? You kind of shy away from such a person. It makes you sad when you observe egotism in other people. But the opposite is true of the Christian life and the Christian character and the Christian ministry, especially of that of John the Baptist. He's a great example to us of someone who is Christ-focused and not self-focused in ministry. He's a great example to imitate and follow when we consider God's call to all Christians, to all churches, and to all pastors today that Jesus must increase and we must decrease as we are all called. All of us, you and I, are called individually, personally, and corporately to a Christ-centered ministry where Christ has the spotlight all the time and in every way. But before we get into specific applications, which are the three points of the message today, servants of Christ, verse 28, rejoicing in Christ, verse 29, and preeminence of Christ in verse 30. Let's first give the meaning of the text followed by these three applications. And so turn back to John chapter three and verse 28. Let's go verse by verse through these three verses. You yourselves bear me witness, John the Baptist said, I am not the Christ. Now John tells the people here that he's already told them several times that he was not the Messiah, he's not the Christ, but was simply sent to prepare the way of the Messiah. But why should these people argue over John and try to form a party around him anyway? He's not as uh, an important person here. As great as John was, he's not really that important. Jesus said, the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than John. So if I'm the least person in the kingdom, and Jesus tells me I'm greater than John the Baptist, then John the Baptist is really not that important. A lot has been made about John the Baptist. And I can hear someone say, well, didn't Jesus say he was the greatest person that ever lived? Yes, in one sense he was. But when you measure things according to kingdom principles, those things which are great physically and outwardly and status-wise are not great with God, are not important with God. God doesn't measure things by the same standard that we use in this world. And so John was simply commissioned to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to draw attention to himself. And he did get a lot of attention. Because what he preached was genuine and real and powerful. And what he said and what he did was powerful. And even John's enemies had to recognize that he was a prophet from God. And so if we have a Christ-centered ministry, let us be recognized for Christ working in us and through us and anointing our ministry and not because of anything outwardly speaking. Just like John the Baptist. John, he had nothing. He wore camel's hair. He didn't have a fancy wardrobe. He didn't keep up with the latest fashion and style. He ate bugs, locusts, and wild honey. He had no home. He didn't have a congregation. He was a voice crying in the wilderness because he couldn't help but preach. Woe is John if he preached not the gospel. 
The Spirit of God came upon him with such a powerful burden for the holiness of Israel and for Israel to return to God and recognize their soon coming Messiah that he just had to spontaneously cry out with nobody around him in the wilderness. Would to God we would have more in the churches with such burdens that it doesn't matter who hears them or who's around them. This is my burden. I'm going to pray here and now. I'm going to look for somebody here and now to witness to. Oh, that we had the spontaneity of John the Baptist. But notice the consistency of his message, which focused on Christ. In his preaching, John never took the spotlight off Christ. He never used fancy stories he never had entertaining anecdotes. He never looked for creative ways to keep the attention of his audience. He had the power of God, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God in his mind, in his heart, and in his spirit. And he just poured forth the raw preaching of God's Word. I would rather do that and have God the Holy Spirit save souls and sanctify and grow the church under the ministry of the word than have all the fancy homiletical or preaching skills in the world. What are they teaching our pastors today in seminary concerning how to preach? Give me five John the Baptist instead of flooding the church with 10,000 mediocre wishy-washy compromising so-called pastors. John never wavered in his message, and it focused on Christ. That's why he came into the world, to preach Christ, to prepare the way of Christ. And neither should we waver. Follow his example. Stand alone if you have to. Don't look at other Christians and compare yourself to other Christians and say, well, they're silent. They don't witness. They have the liberty to do this, that, and the other thing, which is contrary to the word of God. Don't compare yourselves to other people. Follow the word of God alone. Because very often, if you're faithful to God, you will be alone on that path of obedience. John the Baptist began his ministry exalting Christ and directing people to him. And he would end his ministry exalting Christ with his own martyrdom. John himself said in 1.8, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. He kept insisting many times throughout his ministry, I'm not the Messiah, I'm not the Messiah. I can imagine so many pastors today who are so shallow. And they, some of them, are relentlessly assaulted with compliments and praise. I can imagine some of them are, are so weak that they finally give in. Well, I guess I am pretty good. I guess, okay, you're right. I reluctantly agree with you. Can, can we move on? Oh, the false humility. John the Baptist said, nope, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. The Pharisees sent a delegation to him. Who are you? They asked. I am not the Messiah. That's not natural for a human being to turn away attention and the spotlight like that. And so as we look at a Christ-centered ministry through John's character, through his example, we need to follow his humility. It says in verse 28, but I have been sent before him. John says he was sent before the Messiah for a specific purpose, person or purpose, excuse me. John here succinctly says he states his mission, a mission that he received from God. I have been sent before him. In verse 27 of chapter 3, we already looked at this. It says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from above. 
And the mission that was given to John the Baptist was to be the forerunner of Christ. In other words, John was Christ's forerunner, his predecessor, who was to prepare the world for the Messiah and be God's herald to announce the soon appearance of Christ. John said in chapter 1 and verse 23, I am the voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And so God planned from all eternity past to raise up a prophet who would be the forerunner and who would prepare the way of the Messiah. This was prophesied in the book of Isaiah 600 years before John the Baptist was ever conceived. And he was to draw the attention of the world to a Messiah who was to come very soon. So the expectations through the ministry of John the Baptist would be on high alert by people in the world expecting the Messiah to come in that generation. Because this wild man that was the greatest man who ever lived, that had amazing gifts of preaching and prophesying and zeal to overflowing, he prepared the Mediterranean area around Palestine, Jerusalem, Israel for the coming of the Messiah. He was at the Jordan River. He was coming close to many towns and villages, crying out wherever he came or wherever he went with powerful, authoritative, Holy Ghost anointed preaching. People were listening to John the Baptist. Let's move on to verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is filled. Now here in verse 29, John introduces the metaphor of a wedding and a marriage to describe the relationship between three of the most important people in the wedding party. Have you ever been to a wedding? Well, to make a wedding work, there's got to be a bride. There's got to be a groom, and usually is a best man. And those are the three people identified in this metaphor. The bride, the bridegroom, and the friend of the bridegroom, or the best man. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. John the Baptist is the friend of the bridegroom. He's the best man. And the bride is the church. And the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The bride doesn't belong to the best man. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Therefore, it was fitting that the people should follow Jesus than John. John's the best man. He's the forerunner. He's the preparer of the bride for the coming of the groom. The bride represents everyone who is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as the wife of Jehovah. And very often God was grieved. And he says to Israel, his wife that commits harlotry, I'm going to divorce you. So he uses this language, metaphorical language, of a marriage and divorce, a wife, a husband, a groom, a bride, to describe his relationship with Israel. But later in the New Testament, the church is used as a symbol of the bride of Christ. But in the Gospel of John, the bride is used to represent those who left John the Baptist to follow Christ when Christ appeared. So the response I want you to notice is that we don't see John the Baptist being unhappy to lose followers for Jesus. But on the contrary, he says in verse 29, but the friend of the bridegroom, look at it, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. John the Baptist, the best man, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And so John rejoiced in the sense of losing disciples to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was John's great joy to listen to the bridegroom's voice 
he was happy that Jesus received all the attention and not he himself. And John's joy was fulfilled when Christ was exalted above him, when the spotlight was on Christ and not him. And when Christ was praised and Christ was honored by people and not him. That's so often the opposite of what takes place among churches with all this intra-church competition where one church may get more attention than another church and some of the folks, maybe some of the pastors, get jealous and envious and they begin to mimic those methodologies with, which makes their competitors successful so they can be just as successful. It's not about our own individual success as a church that matters. The purpose of the church is to be Christ-centered and Christ-glorifying. It's to glorify God in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the process, we are humbled. And lastly, verse 30, as we move on in our exposition, he must increase, but I must decrease. The entire goal and object of John the Baptist's ministry is summarized in this phrase. He must increase and I must decrease. He labored ceaselessly, pointing men and women to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and to make them realize the true value of the Lord Jesus Christ. People were blind, deaf, ignorant. They were not knowledgeable about the Lord Jesus Christ and his role as the Messiah. John therefore was commissioned by God to make them aware of who Jesus was. John was consumed, therefore, with preaching Christ. That was his message. He wasn't a pastor. He was a prophet with a very specific mission to preach Christ, to honor Christ, to talk about Christ, and to direct everyone to Christ, and to proclaim Christ. I wish I had half of his riveted attention for the entire duration of his ministry where 99.9% .9 of the time, maybe 99% of the time, he preached Christ, and 1% of the time he preached repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, those statistics may be a little lopsided. Don't pin me down on that. But in doing this and always giving Christ the preeminence and directing everybody to Christ, John realized he's got to keep himself in the background. He can never bring himself forward and put Christ in the background. He must always take the low place and give Christ all the attention. That's what we must do here at Christ Bible Church in our worship. Are your thoughts during worship, your mind occupied, consumed with Christ in the different phases of our worship service, during Bible reading, during prayer time, during communion service, during the preaching of the word? Does Christ fade or come in and out of your thoughts with a spotlight on him? And when that spotlight is shined on Christ in your thoughts? Do you pause to praise? Do you pause to thank? Do you pause to worship? Well, that summarizes what we are all about as Christians. Not only during worship, when we share the gospel with people, is our message pinpointed on the person, work, attributes, personality, and character, and mission and gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, a true humble servant of Christ doesn't attract attention to himself. If you're in the spirit, you're humble. You want Christ to get the glory. You want to find a way to bring Christ out of your message and this opportunity to share. You're not looking to elevate yourself. And you only refer to yourself as a supportive, verbal tool to glorify Christ, like sharing your testimony. 
during an evangelistic opportunity. It's only a small tool. And don't linger too long on yourself when you do share your testimony. Focus on Christ. For Paul said, we preach him. He must be preached. He and what he has done and his word and his gospel must fill the minds and hearts of the hearers for the spirit to come and apply that word and that message to them to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And if you don't do that, you'll be a failure to your calling as responsible to preach the gospel, responsible to make Christ the center and focus of every ministry and gift and exercise of those gifts that God has given you. We've all made mistakes in the area of overemphasizing other ministries and other aspects of the word rather than Christ. We've neglected Christ too much. And unknowingly ended up with a man-centered focus and a man-centered ministry and preaching about our church rather than about Christ. Now it's okay to invite people to church and tell people about our church, but we don't take pride in our church. We're fallible, we're weak. And even if we were strong temporarily for a few seconds, we would be responsible to preach Christ anyway. Now, I wanna direct your attention to an important point which serves my overall purpose in this message. I want you to notice the three musts in John chapter three. Ever seen those before? Three times the word must occurs in John chapter three. In other words, this is an inflexible requirement. The first must is in chapter three and verse seven. It's a must for the sinner where he says, you must be born again. The second must is a must for the Savior in chapter 3, verse 14. So, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When I am lifted up, he said, I will draw all men to myself. But he says, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But I want you to notice the third must in our text, verse 30. I must decrease. So the sinner must be born again. The Savior must be lifted up on the cross and die for sinners. But we, saints, must decrease. That's a must. That must happen. There's no negotiation here. I must decrease, and so should you. All right, let's get to our first application. Going back to verse 28, let's look at servants of Christ. In verse 28, we read, You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. John the Baptist was content with his role as a servant. Ultimately, John the Baptist is a servant. As great as he was, his greatness must be seen through the filter and prism of servanthood, servanthood. John the Baptist was chiefly a servant of Christ. He didn't serve himself, but Christ. He said that John was the greatest man that ever lived. The Lord Jesus said that, as I said, but John's greatness is seen in his servanthood. Our churches don't need a hierarchical ranking of the greatest among us to the second tier level of greatness to the third. We don't rank each other by how great we are in the church, in the organization. Corporations and organizations, whether they be ecclesiastical or 501c3s or secular corporations, compare each other to different levels of success, effectiveness, and greatness but not so in the church. John the Baptist's greatness is seen in his servanthood, in his humility. It's seen in his deference to Christ. He's always deferring to Christ. 
I must decrease. He tells Philip and the other disciple, follow the Lamb. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He's sending disciples away. He's not a very good evangelist if his main mission is to preach himself. He's sending other people away to other ministries, to, to Christ. Well, that's his job, of course. And that's our job. We send people to Christ. Yes, we want people to come to our church, but we want them to be saved. And we want saints to know Christ more deeply. Jesus said of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. It seems contradictory, doesn't it? He's great, but he's least. How can you be the greatest, but the least simultaneously? Well, in a sense, in the eyes of God, he's great for a lot of reasons. But greatness is measured by servanthood in terms of the Lord's value. But people of the world don't measure greatness by the standard of being ser <laughs> servants and slaves. Yeah. Go up to the average unconverted person and say, well, you know, there's this lowly servant who makes $3 an hour as my housekeeper. And then there are these slaves still in the backwoods of some country overseas in the third world. They're really great people. They're really superior people of great quality and worth, humanly speaking. And you would have people look at you strange saying, really? Why are they slaves then? The world doesn't measure greatness that way. The way Christians do, the way Bible describes greatness. But we're from a different world. And Christianity has a different standard of greatness. And we value things by God's criteria as taught in the Bible and as revealed to us by the Spirit of God, helping us understand with spiritual understanding that the way up is down. That less is more. That weakness is strength. That's not the way the world thinks. We read in Mark 10, 42, but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Again, turn over to John 13 in your Bibles. John 13, verses 13 through 15. John 13, 13 through 15. John 13, 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The lowliest servant. The Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest one of all, becomes the lowly servant of the Lord and washes the disciples' feet. Matthew 20. Turn over there to verse 26. Matthew 20, 26. We're talking about this idea of servanthood and that John the Baptist is a great example of a great person with all his gifts and his calling and his superior godliness and holiness of lifestyle. Yet he was a servant of God, a humble servant of God who had nothing but camel's hair for clothes and honey and locusts, nothing of this world to gauge his value. Matthew 20, 26, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. 
And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The greatest attribute of a servant is to give his all, to give his life for another person. Now that's a servant. So in a Christ-centered ministry, listen, everyone is a servant. And everyone serves one another. Like John the Baptist. Are you following the example of Jesus and John the Baptist as servants? Both of those great men, especially the Lord Jesus, he's God in the flesh, humbled himself beyond comprehension. They both gave up their lives for the mission God gave them. In the case of Christ, to purchase our redemption. In the case of John the Baptist, he was beheaded because of his preaching and his godliness. Herod couldn't stand it anymore to be rebuked by him. And so therefore, the Lord wants us to follow the example of John the Baptist as a servant. Didn't the Lord Jesus say in Philippians 2, turn to Philippians 2, verses 5 through 9, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 9, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a what? A bondservant or a servant, a slave, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so we don't have a mindset of the world. We, where we want to draw the attention and the spotlight to ourselves and hear the accolades and applause and the praises of people telling us how great we are. No, this mind that is in Christ, a mind of humility, a mind of sacrifice, the mind of a servant, we are to take upon us this same mind, which is contrary to the world, the way the world thinks, what the world values. We must have the same mind and attitude as the Lord Jesus Christ towards each other in a Christ-centered ministry. But so many ministries are self-centered. Oh, they pay lip service that we're all Christians and we follow the golden rule and we love one another and we sacrifice and we're all servants of one another. But it's lip service. It takes very little to provoke the pride and the arrogance and the vainglory and the self-centeredness craving attention to come out of them and dominate very easily and quickly in their ministries and in their relationships. But we must have a deep-rooted, deep-seated, serious humility Because we read in Scripture, in Galatians 5.13, through love, serve one another. Are you serving your fellow believers and members at Christ Bible Church? Are you using your resources, your talents, your gifts, your money, your time to reach out, to take the initiative, to even pray about it beforehand, or to be very sensitive to the needs of people so that you're always ready to serve the needs of the body when those needs are brought to your attention. This mind that is in Christ Jesus is so dominating your mind, you're very sensitive to the needs of other people, especially in your church, that you don't need the pastor to give you a phone call. Oh, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, We've had a need for about three months now and no one has volunteered. Would you mind, please, I beg you, to go and help brother or sister so-and-so? No, through love, we're to serve one another. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves 
your bond servants for Jesus sake there are two things here in this statement that occupy Paul's mind in his general preaching he's preaching Christ 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 and the gospel of Christ and in his relationship with the church he's the servant he's the slave he is meeting the needs of the brethren And he, he says again to the same Corinthian church in his first letter to them in 919. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. And so when we talk about being a servant, we do well to learn the lesson from, for example, the life of Diotrephes. You remember Diotrephes? In 2 John, he was an elder in a church, but a man with great personal ambition and pride. The, the Apostle John, not John the Baptist, but the Apostle John writes about him in 3 John, not 2 John, verses 9 and 10. He says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. The word preeminence here comes from two Greek words, which mean to be fond of being first. Diotrephes was a little pope in his church. He was actually trampling underfoot the truth of the headship of Christ over the church. And he usurped the authority of Christ in that headship in his church. Now, you know, there is, there's only two places in the New Testament where the word preeminence is found. One is negative and one is positive. The negative one is right here in 3 John uh, 9 and 10 where it talks about Diotrephes wanting the preeminence, which means to be fond of being first. He loved being first. He loved getting all the attention. That's why he wouldn't receive visiting preachers and visiting Christians in his church. He threw them all out. No, go away. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine one of your elders going up to any first-time visitors who come to Christ Bible Church, going up to them after the service, tapping them on the shoulder and saying, can I talk to you for a second? And then saying to them, listen, we don't want you back here. Please don't come back here. We don't like you. We don't want you. We don't want anything to do with you. Wouldn't that be the the polar opposite of what Christianity is in its essence as summarized and represented in the two greatest commandments in the Bible? You would, you would be very quick to throw me out if some, some of you found out. There'd be a business meeting called very quickly to discuss what Pastor Joe or Pastor Owen did. The other place in the New Testament where preeminence is found, only two times in the New Testament, this word is found in Colossians 1.18, that in all things he may have the preeminence. You know who he is there, don't you? Jesus. Diotrephes thought more highly of himself than he did of Christ. He could not say with John the Baptist, he must increase and I must decrease. If you cannot say that in sincerity yourself, not pay lip service to it, but say in your heart of hearts, oh, may he increase and I decrease. You know that one little word, that one little letter, I, is our biggest troublemaker. I, it causes us so much trouble and pain and negative consequences. I, 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 I. Someone has said, Diotrephes is the father of a long line of sons who have not learned to distinguish between love for Christ and his church and love for their own place in the church. Secondly, Rejoicing in Christ, verse 29. First, we, we are servants of Christ, as seen 
in John the Baptist. This is what a Christ-centered church is all about. We serve one another. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the example of John the Baptist. Secondly, we rejoice in Christ. We need more rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, verse 29. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, what does he do? Rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Can you rejoice if you see something genuinely that a, a brother or a sister is blessed with that brings glory to Christ? Even though that brother or sister gets a lot of attention in the process. But Christ in the end is glorified. Can you rejoice? That whether in pretense or in sincerity, Christ is glorified and praised. Can you rejoice? That's a sign that the Spirit of God is at work in you. That you can rejoice and be happy for someone else who is rejoicing in Christ rather than jealous. John the Baptist rejoiced that he had part in bringing the church to the Lord. The Hebrew wedding, a Hebrew wedding, was a joyful time. The Jews, one thing they know how to do is celebrate at a wedding. I went, my wife and I went about 10 years ago to an Orthodox Jewish wedding in Miami. Uh, my, our niece is an Orthodox Jew and she married another Orthodox Jew. And it's a traditional con, uh, Orthodox Jewish wedding. <clears throat> And it took place in the synagogue, and then the reception took place in the synagogue as well. I'll tell you, during the reception, the mm -hmm. dancing, you know, these long-bearded guys with black hats, they look like Quakers with the shawls, the prayer shawls, and the earlocks, and these Orthodox Jewish men, they were bouncing off the walls with <laughs> rejoicing and praise. And the women were comparatively doing the same thing in their own way. Jewish weddings are times of great rejoicing mm. and celebration. And the Hebrew wedding was a joyful time, and that's the metaphor that really drives this analogy in verse 29. Now, John the Baptist here parallels the analogy with the reality. He had shared his joy in wooing the bride for Christ, preaching Christ as the forerunner, alerting people who had never heard of such a thing before. Can you imagine having virgin pioneering opportunities in Palestine to preach Christ that John the Baptist had, where not even the Jewish people had a clue that the Messiah was soon to be among them? He was going to show up, and really nobody would be able to recognize who he was. And John had this opportunity to point everybody there to the Lamb of God who was walking the hills and preaching the kingdom himself among their towns and villages. John the Baptist's ministry was similar to Abraham's servant who <clears throat> presented the invitation to Rebecca on behalf of Isaac to come and become Isaac's wife. No image is so intimate as a wedding. Jesus began his ministry at a wedding and he'll complete his work at his own wedding banquet at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do we rejoice in Christ? And lastly, Let's close with the preeminence of Christ. Servants of Christ, rejoicing in Christ, and now the preeminence of Christ. Verse 30. Let's look at this very short verse. The first half of it says, he must increase. Well, increasing is the opposite of decreasing. So first, let's look at the increasing part. The only one that increases ever or should increase with attention is the Lord Jesus Christ. The more attention that's on him and not on us, the more God will use us. We just need to get out of the way. 
and let the focus and attention be on Christ. In a Christ-centered ministry, Jesus is always going up, or at least should be, and we are going down. Jesus is supposed to take the place of preeminence, and we should always seek opportunities to glorify him and elevate his name. That's what Colossians 1, 16 says. Turn there to Colossians 1, 16 through 18. I want you to turn to these scriptures, some of them will, that I give you, not all of them. I'll let you know which ones to turn to. Colossians 1, 16 through 18. I want you to notice the preeminence of Christ and how the Father has designed for Christ to increase in the attention given him first by the church, but then this increase of praise and attention is going to culminate at the end of the world where every single living creature in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth, in hell, will be praising, worshiping, adoring, Jesus Christ, and he will get all the attention and all the preeminence, though right now and throughout Earth's past history, he has not gotten all the attention. Everything is moving in the direction that he will fully occupy all the attention of intelligent life, period, for all eternity future. Can you imagine that? Everywhere sound can be heard. We're going to be hearing maybe in every other second or every other word, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And elements of definition and praise and thanks and glory connected with Jesus Christ will reverberate in our minds and hearts and ears almost constantly for all eternity future. That's what scripture teaches. Why? Well, it says in verse 16 of Colossians 1, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Think about it. In everything. Moving forward, culminating in eternity, he's going to have the preeminence. That means that the attention of all intelligent life will have to be on Christ if he is going to be preeminent in everything. If he's going to be preeminent in heaven, then all the attention's got to be on him. If he's going to be preeminent in worship, then he's going to have to get all the attention in worship. If he's going to be preeminent in godly, heavenly activities, if the saints are going to follow him wherever he goes, then he's going to have to get the full attention of everyone, everything, everywhere, all the time. I can't conceive of that. My limited imagination can't take all that in, and it's many parts, many moving parts, all focused on Christ. But I rejoice in just thinking about it because I'm going to be exposed to and participate in that preeminence for all eternity by praising and thanking and glorifying Him. That in all things He may have the preeminence. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read a choice text about this very thing. His preeminence. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he put all enemies under his feet. Every single enemy Everyone and everything that resists Christ's rule and reign and preeminence will ultimately be put under his feet and be put to silence. And we'll, we will be left with the spotlight on Christ forever. And then in Revelation chapter 5, turn to Revelation 5, 
few minutes and we'll be done. Revelation 5, verse 11. Revelation 5, 11. <clears throat> then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The Greek number, numbering system only went up to 10,000, so they just added on thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. This is an example of what I was talking about earlier concerning the time will come in the not too distant future when he will have all preeminence and all the glory will be focused on him. And there is a very wide description of all the different kinds of creatures that are involved in giving him the preeminence and the glory. The elders, the angels, the living creatures, and the saints. And they're worshiping the Lamb. And wherever they are worshiping on the earth, in heaven and under the earth, even in the sea. They're all praising. They're all saying blessing and honor and glory be to him and to the Lamb. How long? Forever and ever. That's our ultimate journeyman status as worshipers, giving him the glory and the preeminence. Therefore, in giving Christ the preeminence in all things, we must always be bringing up the name of Christ. In your communication, use your words and your vocabulary and your coherent mindset to bring up the name of Christ in a benevolent, positive, gospel-oriented way. In giving Christ the preeminence, we've always got to be talking about the character of Christ. He's perfect in integrity. Talk to people about the perfections of Christ's character. He is goodness personified. He is kind and gentle. He's gracious and merciful. Use your own testimony as proof. Tell them, I'm a witness of the greatness of Christ's kindness to me and patience. Bring out all the glorious character traits of the Lord Jesus Christ by way of personal example. Use your speech and the ability he's given you to communicate to bring out the glory of Christ's character. This will lift up his preeminence. This will elevate the statue of Christ's holiness and his godhood in the eyes of people. In giving Christ preeminence, always be talking about the gospel of Christ and the works of Christ and the attributes of Christ. People do not know about Christ's attributes. They don't know that he is omniscient, that he knows everything, that he said to Nathaniel, when you were under the tree, I saw you. They don't read the Bible. They don't know that he is omnipotent, that he raised Lazarus from the dead, that he created all things and upholds all things by the word of his power. John 1, he was in the world and the world was made by him. They don't know that. Use your speech, your Christian experience, your Christian knowledge, your knowledge of the Bible to talk to people about the works of Christ and the glorious attributes of Christ that he came down from heaven's glory. Eternal God became man. God in the flesh 
dwelt among us and we behold, beheld his glory. Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration saw the deity and the humanity of Christ flashing back and forth. They saw the two natures of Christ, the humanity and then the deity as his appearance, his heavenly appearance shone forth and they were humbled and fell on their faces. Talk to people about Christ. We have so much knowledge. Don't keep it locked up. Preach the doctrines of the cross. The cross, the message of the cross concerning the doctrines of what Christ did on the cross are so sublime. They are the most amazing, gloriously beautiful, wonderful thing that can be described with human language. What Jesus did on the cross in purchasing redemption, justification, reconciliation, propitiation, sanctification, and many other doctrines that represent what Christ accomplished on the cross. They amaze people when you bring them out. I didn't know that. That's the message they need to hear to be able to give him the preeminence by first laying down their lives and be saved by being born again. And then from there, learn as much about Christ as they can and share that same thing. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, turn there. We're to be preaching the doctrines of the cross. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The Apostle Paul made it a point to preach a crucified Christ and the doctrines connected with His crucifixion. He said in Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He boasted in the cross. That means he talked about the cross a lot. And he gained as much knowledge about the cross. He determined not to know anything among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then in Galatians 3, 1, he tells the Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. He came to Galatia, the apostle Paul did, and he preached a crucified Christ. They were going backwards now, the Galatians, by embracing the lie of the Judaizers that they were to be saved by keeping the law plus faith in Christ. He says, no, when I came to Galatia, I portrayed and presented Christ not as a savior who saves us through a combination of keeping the law or our works and faith. No, I presented a Jesus Christ that was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. And he did not depart from his presentation of a crucified Christ so that the Holy Spirit would wipe away from their minds any thought that they could be justified by works. He said later on in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 22, for the Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. What are those two things? Well, though that's the attributes of Christ. He taught them and preached the attributes of Christ concerning the power of God and the wisdom of God that are bound up in Christ. And we also, to give Christ the preeminence, need to preach the gospel of Christ. Paul said in Philippians 3, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, 
but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul labored and on and on and on describing and discussing and talking about the righteousness of God in Christ. We have to get a perfect righteousness in order to go to heaven. God will not allow us into heaven without the perfect righteousness of Christ. Therefore, we need to talk much about the righteousness of Christ, how to obtain it, and how to apply it by faith in Jesus. We need to be constantly talking about the righteousness of God as the grounds, the only grounds, of our salvation, this imputed righteousness of Christ needs to be on our lips, needs to be in our minds, in our hearts, consuming our spirits and ready to come out at any moment. We need to be consumed with the message of the imputed righteousness of Christ and the imparted righteousness of Christ. We need to preach about the majesty of Christ and the glory of Christ. John the Baptist said, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Remember earlier I said they didn't know anything about the coming Messiah. They thought it was going to be some general, military general. He says, it is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. When John says this statement, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He's making a direct reference to slaves untying the master's sandals that are filthy and washing the filthy feet of the master. Only slaves did that. And it was a very shameful duty that everyone looked down upon. But John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to do that which slaves do in washing dirty sandals and dirty feet. Why? Because in the light of his own worthiness, he sees his own unworthiness in the light of the majesty of Christ and the glory of Christ. But then he goes on in the last phrase of verse 30, but I must decrease. I must decrease. I'll stop there. I'll stop there. Next time we'll pick it up at that very last phrase, but I must decrease. I've got some choice nuggets here on this one. You want to be at the next session. I was rejoicing and weeping and laughing. Every emotion imaginable when I went through this study, but especially at the last part where it says, I must decrease. Because it was so edifying to understand what that phrase means. Oh, Pastor Joe, everyone understands that we must deny ourselves. Come on, this is the ABCs, the kindergarten studies of Christianity. Oh, really? It's not even the tip of the iceberg. No, I'm going to stop there. And so, with one closing word, we see then that our ministry is to be circumscribed and characterized by Christ increasing and us decreasing. We need to have a Christ-centered ministry, both corporately and in your individual lives. Take this truth that John the Baptist brought out so beautifully that we are servants of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, and we're to give the preeminence of Christ to him and not be the focus ourselves of anything. We're to give all the glory to Christ. Ask the Lord to make you more and more filled with Christ, that he would be on your minds, your hearts. He would be quickening your spirit all the time to preach a crucified Christ by faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, his crucifixion and his glory, everything about him. Help us, teach us to have a Christ-centered, Christ-focused walk with you, ministry, and church.
In Jesus' name.